Welcome to the Deep Dive, your shortcut to crystal clear insights. Today, we're uh, really unearthing the core principles of artificial intelligence project management and deployment. And we're doing it not through, you know, abstract theory, but through this really sharp, practical lens of real world challenges, stuff that often gets distilled into exam questions, like from the CPMAI V7. That's right. And these aren't just academic questions, far from it. They're really the distilled wisdom from, well, countless AI projects the successes and the failures. We're going to use them to pull out the most important nuggets of knowledge, you know, about building, maintaining AI solutions. It gives you a kind of fast track to being really well informed on these critical topics. It's about understanding not just what you need to do, but really why it matters so much in this uh, very dynamic world of AI. Absolutely. And yeah, our insights today are kind of distilled from that certified project manager in AI, the CPM AI V7 exam framework. But look, this isn't about passing a test. It's about using a really rigorously structured framework that reveals these fundamental truths, you know, about navigating AI projects from the initial idea right through to deployment. Think of it like a playbook for real world AI work. Okay, so let's imagine we're right at ground zero, a new AI initiative. You got the tech talent, maybe the data is piling up, but there's this uh, nagging feeling the business objectives are a bit fuzzy. What's the absolute first pitfall we have to avoid, according to this CPM AI way of thinking? Mm, the first, and you could argue it's the most critical step, is to define the business problem and success criteria, period. Without those crystal clear objectives and, importantly, the metrics for success, you're essentially building in the dark. So what does this actually mean for your projects out there? It's so easy to get swept up in the AI hype, right? Chasing the newest algorithm. But the real value, the gold, isn't just in the tech itself. It's in applying it precisely to solve a, well, a gnarly business problem. Without that clarity up front, it's like building a Ferrari when what you need is a tractor. Exactly. Rushing into the AI part without that clear problem statement. It's just a fast track to yeah. building something that might be technically amazing, but uh, ultimately useless for the actual business. You can have the most sophisticated model imaginable, but if it's solving the wrong problem, or maybe not even a problem at all, it's just you know, an expensive experiment. Okay. Makes sense. So once we've hopefully locked down those objectives, the very next battleground, it seems, is often fought right there in the data trenches. What happens when you hit a wall during data prep? Say you find a key feature and it's just riddled with missing values. What's the uh, best practice way to handle that? Mm -hmm. The best approach generally is to impute missing values based on domain knowledge or statistics. And this isn't just, you know, slapping in an average value, though sometimes it's a starting point. It could involve more sophisticated techniques, things like k nearest neighbors, regression imputation, maybe even using advanced generative models now. But crucially, it should often be guided by deep domain insight. That helps ensure you're not just creating more noise, mm. you know. You want to genuinely preserve the data's integrity, its predictive power. Right. So it sounds like a real tightrope walk. You're trying to retain the quantity of data you have, but without sacrificing its quality or worse, introducing new biases. That feels like a decision that genuinely needs both uh, statistical know-how and that deep domain understanding you mentioned. It absolutely is. Handling missing data properly is just vital because simply, say, removing all the rows with missing values, that can lead to huge data loss, especially if the missing is, isn't random. And just filling them in randomly or with a simple mean, well, that can introduce considerable noise or bias, which then just propagates through your entire model pipeline. Okay, let's shift gears a bit. Let's talk about concept drift. It sounds a bit academic, but it feels like this quiet, almost creeping threat to long-term model performance. It seems like something that can catch even experienced teams off guard. How does it show up beyond just a simple dip in accuracy? Are there less obvious signals maybe listeners should watch for? Yeah, that's a really key point. Concept drift basically means that model performance decreases over time due to changing data distribution. But you're right, it's often more subtle than just the main accuracy metric tanking. It can manifest in uh, slightly changing feature distributions, maybe shifts in the ground truth itself, or sometimes the underlying relationships the model learned, they just aren't valid anymore in the current context. So it's not just the model somehow breaking down on its own. It's more like the world changing underneath it. That's a crucial distinction, isn't it? It's not just a model failing in isolation, but the very world shifting beneath its feet. That really makes the case for continuous monitoring. It's not just a nice to have. It feels like a fundamental necessity for any AI system that's actually live out in the wild. Exactly. And recognizing concept drift early, or at least planning for it, helps you schedule regular model updates or retraining 
that prevents a gradual but potentially significant drop in your AI system's actual usefulness, which you know can have real business consequences down the line. Okay, moving towards getting these models out there. Readiness for the real world. Before you actually deploy an AI model into production, what's a truly crucial consideration, something you absolutely cannot afford to skip? Uh, you really need to ensure the model is interpretable and explainable. Before that deployment happens, especially especially in critical applications, think healthcare, finance stakeholders need to understand why the AI is making certain decisions. It's fundamental for building trust and, frankly, for allowing accountability. Yeah, think about it, right? If an AI makes a decision that significantly impacts someone's life, maybe it's a loan approval, maybe a medical diagnosis, you need to be able to understand the reasoning behind it. Explainability isn't just some technical nicety. It feels fundamental for diagnosing issues when things go wrong, for ensuring you're meeting regulatory compliance, and just for fostering user adoption, people won't trust what they can't understand. Exactly. Without that interpretability, you might have a really powerful black box, maybe it gets great scores on paper, but you won't necessarily have a trustworthy system. <laughs> or one you can easily debug, or one that you can confidently say is ethically sound. Okay, speaking of evaluation and getting good scores, what happens if you've got imbalanced classes in your classification problem? Let's say uh, detecting a really rare disease where positive cases are you know, few and far between compared to negative ones. Which metric gives you a much better read on true performance than just simple accuracy in that kind of scenario? Right, that's a classic trap. In cases of imbalanced classes, metrics like precision and recall are far, far superior to just looking at overall accuracy. Yeah. Accuracy can be incredibly misleading there because think about it, a model could just predict the majority class say no disease every single time, and it might still look 99% accurate if the disease is only present 1% of the time, but it would be completely useless because it misses all the rare but critically important positive cases. Mm -hmm. That really underscores it, doesn't it? Choosing the right metric can prevent a huge misunderstanding of your model's actual performance, its real-world value. It's about getting that nuanced view, understanding what the model is really good at, especially when identifying that minority class, like in fraud detection or those medical diagnostics, is the whole point. Precisely. Precision tells you, okay, among all the times the model predicted positive, how many were actually correct. Recall tells you, among all the actual positive cases that exist, how many did the model correctly identify? You often look at them together, maybe with something like the F1 score, to get a much more balanced and accurate picture of performance in those tricky, imbalanced situations. Let's uh, bring the human element back into this. In these complex AI projects, who typically carries the main responsibility for communicating the AI risks, the progress, the business impact, specifically to the non-technical stakeholders? That responsibility, primarily, it falls to the project manager. They really act as that essential bridge, that translator between the you know, highly technical development teams and the business stakeholders. Those stakeholders need to understand the progress, the potential risks, the overall business impact, but without getting totally lost in the technical weeds, the jargon. So the project manager is like the crucial translator, the diplomat almost. Have you, uh, have you ever seen a situation where that translation maybe broke down badly? What was the fallout from that? Oh, absolutely. I recall one project, it was a while back, where the technical team kept talking about precision and recall improvements. They kind of assumed the business folks understood the nuances. But the business stakeholders, they only really heard the word accuracy or maybe just improvement. So when the model launched and didn't deliver on what they thought accuracy meant in their context, well, it wasn't just a technical setback. It became a real crisis of trust between the teams. That's why the PM's role isn't just about sending status reports. It's about active translation, managing expectations, and sometimes, you know, being the bearer of complex truths. It's absolutely vital for bridging that gap. Wow. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Shifting to methodology, given how much uncertainty and frankly, discovery is often involved in AI initiatives, you don't always know exactly what you'll find in the data or how the model will behave, what's a key benefit of using agile methods and AI project management. A really key benefit is that agile enables iterative development and adapts to changes quickly. It fosters this flexible, incremental approach to making progress on the project. And that iterative nature is just perfectly suited to the, well, the often unpredictable and evolving nature of AI development. Right, so that means AI projects can continuously refine their direction, maybe 
pivot based on early results, adapt as new data comes in, or as business requirements themselves evolve, which seems incredibly common in this fast-moving field. It feels like it significantly reduces risk compared to, say, a rigid waterfall approach, and often leads to better outcomes because you're constantly learning, course correcting, and integrating feedback along the way. Yeah, that agility allows teams to learn from early experiments, maybe small deployments, and continuously improve. You're not locked into this rigid upfront plan that might become completely outdated halfway through the project, which can easily happen with AI. All right, let's get a bit visual now. Thinking about exploring the data itself, which specific exploratory data analysis technique, EDA, is particularly helpful for quickly understanding correlations between different features in your data set? Uh, for correlations, a go-to technique would be heat map visualization. Hmm. Heat maps give you this really clear, visual way to see the correlation matrix. It shows the strength of the relationship between all pairs of features, usually using you know, color intensity to represent how strong that correlation is, positive or negative. Yeah, I find those incredibly useful. Just by glancing at a heat map, you can quickly spot which features tend to move together, which move in opposite directions, or maybe even identify features that seem redundant because they're highly correlated with others. It's like this powerful visual shortcut to understanding complex data relationships, and that understanding can then inform really crucial decisions about, say, feature engineering or selection before you even start modeling. Exactly. It allows you to quickly pinpoint potential multicollinearity issues where features are too similar, which can mess up some models. It's really a foundational step in understanding your data landscape before you dive into more sophisticated modeling. Okay, now for something that feels like a non-negotiable cornerstone, especially as AI becomes more pervasive, what ethical concern is absolutely critical when you're deploying AI in sensitive fields, thinking, you know, healthcare, finance, maybe even hiring. Yeah, absolutely critical. The core ethical concerns in these sensitive domains usually boil down to data privacy and fairness. Okay, so data privacy is about protecting individuals' private, often sensitive information, ensuring it's handled securely, used appropriately, maybe anonymized correctly. And fairness, well, that's about making sure the AI system treats all groups equitably. You have to actively work to avoid introducing or amplifying bias or discrimination, which can easily happen if your training data itself reflects existing societal biases, for example, leading to unfair loan approvals or skewed medical diagnoses across different demographic groups. Hmm. This really highlights the immense responsibility that comes with building and deploying these powerful tools, doesn't it? How do we ensure that as we build AI that can do amazing things, we're also building it responsibly with human well-being, fairness, really at the forefront, especially mm. when these decisions can impact people's lives so directly. It's a huge challenge. Neglecting these areas isn't just, you know, bad practice. It can lead to really severe consequences, legal trouble, regulatory fines, definitely eroding public trust in AI, and perhaps worst of all, actually perpetuating or even worsening societal inequalities. So it's absolutely fundamental to building robust and trustworthy AI. Okay, finally, let's talk about what happens after the big launch. The model is deployed, it's running. Why is continuous monitoring so important at that stage? Right, deployment isn't the end of the story. Mm -hmm. Continuous monitoring is crucial primarily because models may become outdated as data changes. Mm. And this ties directly back to what we were discussing earlier with concept drift. The real world isn't static, it's dynamic. The patterns, the relationships in the data that your model learned during training they might not hold true six months down the line or even next week sometimes. Yeah, it's this fundamental recognition that AI systems aren't like traditional software that you just deploy and maybe patch occasionally. They're living things, in a sense, constantly interacting with the changing environment. The real world evolves. The data feeding your models will change. Monitoring is how you detect that change early enough, hopefully before performance seriously degrades so you can take action, maybe retrain the model, adjust it, fine tune it. It's about that proactive ongoing care for your AI investment to maintain its value. Exactly. Think of it as proactive maintenance. It ensures the AI solution remains effective, remains relevant, and continues to deliver the expected business outcomes long after that initial deployment excitement wears off. And maybe here's a final thought for you to mull over. Think about how the careful application of these, what might seem like purely technical considerations, things like really understanding concept drift or prioritizing model explainability, aren't actually just about building better models in a technical sense. They're fundamentally about building trust and about ensuring that AI truly serves human needs responsibly and effectively, especially as it becomes more and more integrated into our lives, into our world.